Hello! The phrase prevention is better than cure is often attributed either to the Dutch philosopher Desiderius Erasmus in around 1500 or to the one who is traditionally regarded as the father of medicine, Hippocrates, in the 5th century BC. Regardless of who actually formulated this phrase, the idea behind it could not be more true than in the field of medicine. And vaccines are cardinal to the prevention of various diseases. But how did we come to create vaccines and what is their relation to cows? Next on Random History. Before we talk about vaccines, we should say a few words about the threats that our body faces constantly. Our organism is under the unrelenting attack of its surroundings under the form of microbes and viruses. These microbes and viruses can cause a variety of illnesses and are collectively called pathogens. The attacks to our well-being are not only external, however, but internal as well, since potentially cancerous cells seem to be frequently created. Thankfully, we are not undefended against these dangers. The immune system seals us from these external and internal attacks by removing the harmful microbes and viruses and cancerous cells. Specialized cells work together as part of this protective system. These cells could be considered as the soldiers of the immune system. As with any army, the soldiers of the immune system are divided into teams. Each team responds to an eventual threat in a different way so that the response of the system as a whole is more effective. At the moment of the attack by a pathogen, the immune system hasn't got the time to, let's say, recognize its attacker. So the first cells to respond to the threat are the ones which are part of the so-called non-specific immune response. As the term implies, this sort of response is not aimed at the specific pathogen. The main purpose of the non-specific immune response is to immediately prevent the spread of a virus or a microbe throughout the body. As the immune system is reacting via the non-specific immune response, immune cells that are part of the second line of defense come into action aiming to recognize the specific pathogen. This second line of defense is called adaptive immune response. The cells belonging to the second group produce chemicals and proteins such as antibodies that aim the specific virus or microbe. The adaptive immune response might not be immediate since it takes time to prepare the defense towards the pathogen, but it is highly effective and long-lasting. This means that if we come into contact with the specific pathogen again, the cells of the adaptive immune response will remember it and react to it immediately. So, the collective response of the immune system will be a lot more effective and swift. As we saw, for the response of the immune system to reach its peak effectiveness, the adaptive immune response must kick in, but this takes time. Before vaccines, in order for the immune system to achieve immediate adaptive immune response, one had to come in contact with the pathogen. This means that one first had to get sick. As a result, many were infected and a high percentage of them suffered serious consequences or even died. But is it possible to sort of train the immune system to defend itself from a pathogen without having to face the dismal prospect of being infected? In come the vaccines. The core idea behind their creation was to find a way to have someone come in contact with a form of the pathogen which is non-lethal but strong enough to provoke the response of the immune system. This way, if the person was to get into contact with the actual pathogen, the immune system would promptly respond to it and the infection would thus be prevented. As a matter of fact, one could say that the idea of teaching the body to react to the external threat by coming in contact with a diminished form of the specific threat is very, very old. A term has been coined to describe it. Mithridatism. Mithridates VI was the ruler of the Hellenistic kingdom of Pontus in modern-day Anatolia from 120 to 63 BC. He so feared being poisoned that he devised the method of regularly ingesting small non-lethal doses of a poison, aiming to develop resistance to it. Mithridatism could hardly be called vaccination, but the idea behind it is there. Sort of.
One cannot avoid talking about smallpox when dwelling into the history of vaccines since it is the first disease against which people were vaccinated. Smallpox was an infectious disease, keyword in this phrase being was. Keep that in mind, we'll come back to it later. The causing factor of smallpox is the variola virus. Variola comes from medieval Latin and it means pustule, which is a pimple filled with pus or a small blister. People having contracted smallpox initially had symptoms such as fever and vomiting. These symptoms were soon followed by the formation of ulcers in the mouth and the skin rash. This rash, after a number of days, turned into characteristic fluid-filled blisters, hence the name variola. When the blisters healed and fell off, they used to leave behind scars that would remain on the skin for the rest of the person's life. Contaminated individuals spread the virus when they coughed or sneezed via droplets from their mouth and nose. These droplets transferred the virus to various objects such as clothing or surfaces touched by a patient, and people touching the contaminated objects came into contact with the virus. It has been estimated that every person with smallpox could infect between five and seven other people, which makes the disease highly infective. 12.5% of the infected people would eventually perish. In 18th century Europe, approximately 400,000 people died every year by smallpox. Even in the 20th century, it has been estimated that up to 300 million people met their fate because of it. Having survived the infection from smallpox meant that immunity against it was developed and one would not contract it again. The term immunity describes the capability of our body to resist to a harmful virus or microbe after having successfully fended off the initial infection. In 18th century Europe, almost all adults were immune to smallpox. Because of its infectiveness, more or less everyone had been infected as a child and had either died or survived and developed immunity. There are accounts from the 1500s which indicate that China and possibly India began the practice of deliberately transferring pus from smallpox blisters to an uninfected individual. This way, a mild infection was introduced to the healthy individual, followed by lifelong immunity. The specific practice was introduced by Lindy Montague in England in 1721 and was named variolation. The problem with the variolation was that it sometimes proved fatal. Bernoulli, the famous mathematician and physicist, however, managed to prove by statistical reasoning that the benefit from the eradication of smallpox achieved through variolation was worth the risk related to the specific method. He published his conclusions in a classic study in 1766. Bernoulli used in his study a table drawn by none other than Edmund Healy, the astronomer who named the famous comet. Smallpox was such a serious problem that the creme de la creme of the European thought was wholeheartedly involved in finding a lasting solution. Cowpox is a disease characterized by the formation of ulcers on cow teeth, which can spread to humans at the site of a scratch or an abrasion. Typically, a person that has contracted cowpox would simply get away with an ulcer or two on one or, less frequently, both hands. These ulcers were localized and self-contained. England. The year is 1768. A local surgeon and apothecary, which is practically a modern-day chemist named John Fuster, makes an intriguing observation. He notes that two brothers named Creed had been variolated, but one did not react at all to variolation. After further investigation, he realized that the brother who did not react had previously contracted cowpox. This observation left Fuster wondering whether cowpox might protect against smallpox. He was not aware of this possibility. He seems to have discussed his thoughts with colleagues whom he encouraged to take up inquiry on the matter. In the following years, at least five investigators seem to have successfully tested in humans a cowpox vaccine against smallpox. However, none of them was so meticulous as a young medical apprentice who lived in a village less than eight miles from Fusters with whom he seems to have had a friendly relationship. 
The name of this young man was Edward Jenner. It is impossible to talk about the history of vaccines and omit the name Edward Jenner. He is the English general physician and scientist credited with the creation of the world's first vaccine on the eve of the 19th century. A common belief in Jenner's time was that milkmaids who frequently contracted cowpox did not get smallpox. Someone contracting cowpox got away with one or two self-healing ulcers on a hand. On the other hand, however, no pun intended here, having contracted smallpox would likely leave one with disfiguring scars at best or cause a gruesome death at worst. Jenner, who had previously been inspired by Fuster's observations, decided to determine whether having contracted cowpox would actually protect one from smallpox. The way Jenner chose to proceed would most likely be deemed unacceptable by a modern-day medical ethics committee. The year is 1796. Jenner decides to inoculate an eight-year-old boy named James Phillips with cowpox. He first scraps pass from the blisters on the hand of a milkmaid who had caught cowpox from a cow called Blossom. Then he proceeds to introduce the pass through smaller abrasions he deliberately caused on the boy's both arms. Little Phillips produces only some fever and uneasiness, but no full-blown infection. Six weeks after the cowpox inoculation, Dr. Jenner inoculates the boy with variolous material. This was the standard procedure of variolation at the time. The boy shows no reaction. The variolation treatment is repeated and still no reaction from the boy. Little Phillips is immune to smallpox. The beauty of Jenner's new method of vaccinating with cowpox virus is that it is not only effective, it is also much, much safer. The good doctor publishes his observations on the boy and 21 more subjects in a volume named An Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the Variolae Vaccinae. The news starts to spread worldwide like wildfires. There is a new weapon against an old, lethal enemy. Cowpox served as a natural vaccine until the modern-day vaccine emerged in mid-20th century. Thanks to this vaccine, smallpox was eradicated from North America in 1952 and Europe in 1953. In 1959, the World Health Organization started a plan to free humanity from smallpox. This program ended by 1977 when smallpox was eradicated from Africa. We nowadays have vaccines against more than 20 life-threatening diseases. It has been calculated that thanks to immunization programs, between 2 and 3 million deaths are prevented on a year basis. The term used by Jenner in his publication in 1798 to describe his new way of immunizing people against smallpox came from Latin and was variolae vaccinae. Variolae translates as blisters containing pus or pustules, a term with a connotation which is far from positive. Vaccinae, on the other hand, translates as cows, a term with far more lexical charm. Hence, variolae was forgotten, whereas vaccinae stuck. One could say that it was a matter of marketing. But only the vaccine against smallpox comes from the cow. So why do we nowadays use the term vaccination universally? In comes another famous doctor from France this time. He is none other than Louis Pasteur. For almost a century after Jenner, the term vaccination referred exclusively to the inoculation of a person with cowpox pus. In 1885, however, Pasteur tested what he called a rabies vaccine, appropriating the term vaccine. From then on, the term's meaning was permanently stressed beyond its Latin words association with cows and cowpox virus. Fun fact, remember Blossom? It was the cow that infected the milkmaid from the hands of whom Jenner collected the pus that he used to inoculate young Phillips. Given the importance of vaccines, her hide was preserved and it now hangs on the St. George's Medical School Library, now in Tooting. 
And this was the story behind cows and vaccines. In the description below, you can find some resources for further reading. If you feel so inclined, please like, share and subscribe in order not to miss out on our future videos. And if you have any suggestions for subjects you would like us to dwell into, note them in the comments below. Until the next time, keep learning!